Lake of the Woods District here near the Manitoba border has always been at the hub of trade and transportation. If you wanted to move east-west across the northern half of this continent, this is the route you took. And with one portage, you could get into the southern waterways or into the rivers and lakes of the north. I guess it's because of that that the accounts of the people who populated this area are so well documented. In this program, we will focus on a place called Rat Portage. Well, it's a wonderful name. Didn't last. Kenora was once known as Rat Portage. So come along with us. We'll take you through all the steps from prehistoric times through the fur trade, through the gold rush, the building of the transcontinental railway, through the border wars. Well, they were not exactly wars, but adventures all here in Northwestern Ontario. The gathering of the anglers on a morning in August. It is in keeping that the Lake of the Woods continues to draw people from far and wide. Today, it's the International Bass Fishing Derby. In this land of contrasts, transportation and abundant food supplies, fish, caribou, and wild rice still being harvested in an age-old way furthered civilizations. Patty Reed. One of the things we have to remember about Rat Portage in Kenora and Lake of the Woods is that our environment is dominated by water. So the water is important because we sit at the crossroads of the continent, literally. Everyone from 9,000 years ago up until the coming of the railway in the 1890s passes through here if they're going west. It's the only route. So we sit at the hub literally of a transportation network that goes back thousands and thousands of years. Highways, the railway, a base for float planes. The theme continues. As he readies for takeoff, pilot Mike Maloney's passenger is Doug Cameron, a veteran of the era when bush pilots were kings. The Kenora story. There are dozens of chapters in it, a factor that makes the community what it is. Kyler Cotton. It's a quintessentially Canadian kind of place. It sort of looks in four directions, all at the same time. The, the water routes, um, the traditional water routes, flow to, to the north and to, to the Hudson Bay. Uh, but they originate in the United States. It has all of the attributes of a boreal forest with the resources, the timber, the mining, uh, the lakes, all of the, the water powers, all of those things, which make it look like um, many northern Ontario towns. But it has always looked westward. Much of, of those resources have gone to the west. And heading west, the 1948 de Havilland Otter, the oldest of its kind, is off for a short 50-kilometer jaunt to Manitoba. A remnant of glacial Lake Agassiz, the waterway, dotted with more than 14,000 islands, is an oasis of natural heritage. Scott Lockhart. I think the bird species which really attract people's uh, attention here would be 
three or four species, such as the bald eagle, the turkey vulture, the white pelican. Um, those are the species which are fairly large in size and which really are easy to see when you're out in the field here. We estimate that we have about 5,000 nesting pairs of white pelicans here on the lake. So it is just traveling up here in the spring to um, find suitable nesting areas on the remote islands of the lake. The Lake of the Woods area does have a very high number of nesting bald eagles. The number of bald eagles have been steadily rising since around the 1970s to the point where we have about 150 nesting pairs. The eagles, when they see somebody fishing, they'll come around, they'll perch on the tree, fly, or fly around up, you know, far up. And what we usually do is if we catch a perch or something that we can't keep, eh, we throw it out to, to feed them. And they come swooping down and pick it up right close by. You know, both the uh, golden eagle and uh, the bald eagle. In matters of trade, wild rice was a gold currency for the Paleo people of 7,000 years ago, who played a part in an enduring trend. And we moved from these earlier peoples into a greater population, more varied technology. People have started to use uh, native copper. And here is a spear point from this area from approximately five to 4,000 years ago. And it's very interesting, this piece we've identified a positively as coming from Lake Superior through trace element analysis. From Kenora, people are trading all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico because we're on a river system that allows us to get down to the Mississippi. And this copper from Lake Superior shows up, for example, in places like St. Louis. And marine shells from uh, the Gulf of Mexico show up here in Kenora. Population increases. So until about, um, oh, say 2,000 years ago, we're into a full-fledged civilization, the mound builders. The people who built the huge burial mounds on the Rainy River and up into this area, uh, they're making gorgeous, gorgeous pottery vessels. And they're building large villages. One of them uh, probably had as many as 3,000 people in it on the Rainy. Here in Kenora, I've got at least 15 archaeological sites um, just in the town that cover this whole span. By about 2,000 years ago, uh, the people are using wild rice to a huge extent, almost to the extent of farming and taking a lot of fish. Areas like the Rainy River, which flows into the south end of Lake of the Woods, that has a long tradition as a, a very valuable fishing area for the Ojibwe people, for Lake Sturgeon. So they have uh, a very strong affinity for the species, and it's something which they depended upon as a primary food source. Yeah, the outline is quilt. For Dorothy Fable, early recollections feel simultaneously like a millennia and a yesterday away. They lived off the land mostly, uh, fishing naturally. They'd set nets and snare rabbits, deer, moose. I remember. Um, my father was a trapper, and he'd be gone a couple of months at a time. Come home with a lot of uh, fur, and he'd take my grandfather, and they'd go to town, you know, and sell them, and come back with supplies, like flour, sugar. You know, we wouldn't go uptown to the streets, and my mother would, would make a little uh, campfire and have tea and wait for my father, you know, or the men, the only ones that went up to town, like, yeah. The Lover Andres building of Fort St. Charles in 1732 began a community that today includes neighboring Kiwaden and Jaffrey Malik. Here, where the Lake of the Woods spills into the Winnipeg River, 
resources have forever affected society. With the fur trade, the native way of life changed dramatically. You went from a subsistence economy to a barter economy. So the, the weapons, the technology, and even the lifestyles change fairly dramatically too. And this is reflected in, in the artifacts that we find on these sites. And we're very lucky in this village that we've excavated that it has the whole range of history of Kenora on it. It goes back 7,000 years. And a good news story for eagle populations, the elimination of DDT in the 1970s. When we find a nest, where we go up into the tree, into the nest itself, and, and uh, work with the eagles as far as uh, banding them, taking several measurements to determine whether it's a male or, or a female bird. Um, the age of the young eagles is about six weeks old when we're working with them. And what we've seen is that there seems to have been a, a really dramatic increase in the number of nests which produce young since around the mid-1970s. This summer, we went out and banded about 110 young eagles here, which is the most of which we've ever done here. The way I was told about the, the eagle, it's closer to the creator, and he's the uh, sort of the messenger. So we, we feel blessed when they, when they come around, you know, you know, for your tobacco at that time, because it's a real sacred bird. The route that inspired many a vivid record saw rush hour with the hottest European fashion trend of the 17 and 1800s, the beaver hat. It wasn't until 1836 that the Hudson Bay Company actually established a post here in Kenora on an island uh, at the foot of the falls. You always have records in the Northwest Company and the uh, Hudson Bay Company especially not necessarily of the scenery and the roots and so on, but of where they pick up food along the way, which is really important to them. They start at Fort William. Then they stop on Lake of the Woods for what they call wild oats, which is wild rice. Um, because it's essential, they can't get all the way to Winnipeg, where they're going to change diet to pemmican, which is made out of buffalo meat and berries. So all of these are reflected in their diaries. And the bottleneck is always here at Rat Portage. This was the Trans-Canada Highway even then but it was just by water. Sport angling remains as part of an industry that's always been important to the region, and one that earlier this century was threatened. There was like millions of pounds of fish removed, it wasn't a controlled harvest, and as a result, that uh, fishery was on the verge of extinction. Since then, we have seen the number of, of uh, sturgeon go back up, and we do have a uh, fairly viable fishery here, now mainly on the south end of Lake of the Woods. The Lake of the Woods, from recreation and natural heritage to empire building with a bank of resources, has historically drawn the crowds who came to seek out the new El Dorado. In terms of the, the non-native population, they really started arriving after the, in significant numbers, after the Hudson Bay um, relinquished their claim to Western Canada, or was purchased by Canada um, in the mid 18, late 1860s. The land developers, the capitalists, the timber, barons, all of those people who had made their money in the e eastern Canada were all sitting waiting for this to, to be opened up. And so it happened virtually overnight um, in terms of the rush to the west. The place was incorporated amid controversy as Rat Portage by Manitoba in 1882. With a million dollar dowry of gold and timber, the community was soon courted by more than one suitor with more than one offer. 
And we can also uh, trace things like uh, our more recent history, the coming of the railway, which dramatically altered things for Rat Portage, which then became Kenora in 1898. Uh, changed us from a fur trade economy to a mining and forestry economy. We attracted a fair bit of industry and a lot of people coming from Winnipeg, which is a very well established city at the time, to build summer homes on the lake, at the wealthier people. There was a problem in getting a bank to open here and to get more business to relocate because they didn't like the name Rat Portage, not realizing that it was really Muskrat Portage. Uh, in Ojibwe, it's Muskrat Portage. Now, trappers, even now, refer to muskrats simply as rats. So it became abbreviated to Rat Portage. And at the same time, there was a scheme for the three communities, which were Rat Portage, Norman, and Kiwaitan, to amalgamate, which they did, finally, in 1898. So they renamed Rat Portage Kenora, the K-E for Kiwaitan, the N-O uh, for Norman, and then R-A for Rat Portage. There were commissions combing the land for the mineral resources, the timber resources, the, um, the land development, the water powers. Everybody was looking to make money. So we got into this big border dispute as to where, were, where was the western boundary of Ontario. Nobody knew for sure. And how big was the province of Manitoba? The federal government allowed them to get as big as they wanted to because the larger they got, uh, the more resources could accrue to the federal government. So at one point you had uh, this moving boundary that was as far east as, as the height of land, just, east of just west of Thunder Bay, all the way over to just outside the city of Winnipeg, the little postage stamp province of or the Red River Colony. And at one point it ran down the main street of the town of Kenora. The practical effect of that situation was that since there was a dispute on jurisdiction, nobody could make their laws stick. You had the prospect of the federal uh, magistrate arresting the Ontario constable uh, for seizure of liquor and the Ontario constable in turn getting together a crew of, of his customers and, and liberating the booze from the magistrate's office and neither one of them having a courthouse or a judge prepared to back up the charge, or if they were, uh, no place to lock them up. Despite the fact that there were any number of laws, for practical purposes, it was wide open territory for the booze runners. A timeline which stabilizes is the role that Dorothy Fable believes tradition plays in modern First Nation society. Originating in Ojibwe culture, the jingle dress holds its place in the celebration of ancestry. Years ago, they were, they still are, very sacred dresses. When I was going to have one, wear one, right away my mother sat me down and started talking to me how to, uh, how to look after it and uh, how to behave when you're wearing it even. It's quite a, a task to make a, a jingle dress. They used to use uh, the tin Copenhagen covers, the snuff tops, the boxes over there. But uh, now we have to resort to a different tin because uh, the snuff tops are not made anymore. You see it and all the powwows and all the uh, competition powwows mostly. Um, anybody wears them now. And giving voice to the millennia, a gold mine of pictographs, rock art lives as a precious account of a sacred world. One of the byproducts of having a stable food source is that people have time to develop their culture. We know, for example, that the Indian rock paintings and carvings in this area, on Lake of the Woods and in the Kenora area, and there are hundreds of them literally in northwestern Ontario, the largest concentration on the continent, are expressions not just of, of art, but also of religion. And there's the Orion figure, Orion the Shaman again. It's the hundreds of paintings done with red ochre, which is a hematite, iron ore, 
mixed with bear grease or sturgeon oil, tell us about their artistic abilities, but because we know about the Ojibwe religion and how it ties into medicine, we also know that these shrines in the wilderness, if you will, are part of religious quests, visions in the quest for medicine to ensure the well-being of the people. The Grand Medicine Society of the Ojibwe, the Midewiwin, is still very strong in this area, and the rock paintings are still in use indeed. Up here, Patty. Joe Prince, eh? That's great. They're being uh, used for prayer. There are offerings left at them, and uh, whenever we visit, for example, or other people visit, we always insist that they're treated as holy places. That's an ideal place to leave offerings. Coming home. Be it a short run or a long time away, a theme that runs through the region's story is that of the pull of the land, a reverence for lake, hard rock, and bush, a place for humankind in the nature of things. The pages of Kenora's history are dog-eared, age-old, for the chapters of its past are bound up in the dreams of a hundred centuries the rock art, the burial mounds, the structures of the villages, and the extraordinarily advanced uh, technology for making everything from pottery to stone tools. Uh, they just fascinate me. Sometimes I wish I could travel back in time 2,000 years and meet these people. The best way to really discover what you're missing is to, is, is, is to move to a new area. And that's uh, something which I did when I, when I went away to school. If you just go out and spend a few hours driving around and see the bald eagles and see all the fish species around, there really are very few areas in North America that has the diversity that we have here. And that's something which, which is hard to move away from. I moved away and I know how it felt when I moved away. I had to, but I was out for 37 years. There, but I always came back. I had to because this is where I was. Uh, I was born and raised here, and my roots were here. As a history observer, it's it's a fun place to be. You can see the big, the larger picture. The constitutional issues are all there, but how that plays out on a practical level and on a people level is also there. And you combine that with the kinds of characters that it takes to live with the land and on the land and to open up the land and you have the whole kaleidoscope like i say you stand at the crossroads and watch it happen